Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another episode of Nuggets News. Today we welcome a special guest and that is David from Pegnet. And I thought what better time to talk about everything that's happening around the world, particularly with the Financial Stability Board and that report they put out about possibly banning stable coins. And this project is very much focused on that area. So David, welcome to the channel. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. It's a project that I've heard lots about. Uh, Blockchain Brad, you know, he's always telling me this is a hidden gem and whatnot. So, look, I'm really passionate about DeFi and stable coins. I've done a lot of research on myself. So, I'm actually really looking forward to you telling me more about this project and seeing where this conversation goes today. So, for those that haven't followed uh, Pegnet, do you want to give us the, uh, the brief rundown of what it is and then we'll dive into all the nuances later? Sure. Uh, at a high level, Pegnet is effectively a consensus based stablecoin network. So most people are familiar with reserve-based stablecoin networks, Tether, USDC, they've got theoretically some amount of dollars in an account and hopefully an equal number of units. Um, I think central reserves are really vulnerable as we've seen to hacks and regulatory pressure. Um, so sort of the second thing you had evolve was uh, all of these systems where you deposit some ETH, you've got some collateral, and you're trying to balance that collateral. But that has its own challenges when the value of that collateral declines. How do you maintain the value? Mm -hmm. um, and that effectively proposes a, a, a third way, which is consensus-based. So proof-of-work miners, old-fashioned people running a hashing algorithm with their CPUs, are submitting the prices for the top 20 crypto, the top 20 uh, fiat currencies, gold and silver, every 10 minutes. And the algorithm basically comes to the median price over that 10 minutes, and it rewards those miners with the native PEG token. So there's a mining reward for submitting lots of hash power and accurate data. That's it. That's really as simple as PEGnet is. There's no central reserve. There's no intermediary. There's no counterparty. It's just you and the protocol. And it uses a system where you burn value in and mint an equal number of tokens. So you had a thousand bucks of peg, you burned it and made, let's say, a thousand peg dollars or a thousand dollars worth of pegged ETH, whatever the case might be. And that's how the system works. It's just honest accounting. So the simple burn and mint model, I think, is, is really elegant and solves so many of the big problems that we see in stablecoins today. So anyway, that's why I'm so excited about it and just kind of give you a high level idea. I've already got plenty of questions, which is which is great. So uh, you already answered, I guess, the first step. If I want to buy $1,000 of a uh, peg representation of gold, I need to buy $1,000 worth of peg net and then put that into the system. Yeah. Am I, is the collateral or who's on the other side of that? Is that just the, the network? Uh, and then I get that representation because I've burned $1,000 of peg? Exactly. So let's say you bought that thousand dollars of peg off an exchange, you withdrew it to your personal pegnet wallet, and inside your own wallet, you did a conversion from that thousand bucks of peg to a thousand dollars of peg USD. Um, and there's no collateral. You're not locking it up in a contract. You're destroying that peg. It's removed from supply, yeah. and you're getting an equal amount. So really, it's just using it as an accounting function. How do I honestly prove on chain that I put as much value in as I have in my wallet? That's really it's all it's doing, but that's magic. I mean, that solves all the reserve problems of some central entity having to prove they have the money in the account that they say and having a central issuer. In Pegnet, effectively, anybody can issue their own stablecoin. You're not getting them from somebody else. They don't already exist in a pool in the protocol. They're created when you did that burn. Yeah. So no, really, there's nobody else involved but you and recording that on the protocol. Cool. So I'm just playing it all through uh, in my mind. There's a variety of people trading these 42 different assets. They're going up or down. If I buy uh, PEG Ethereum, for example, and it goes from $100 to $300, if I decide to sell that, I'm assuming the mm -hmm. PEG token gets burnt the same as it, as it went in and I get 300 PEG tokens out. Is that correct? So it's actually not required to go out through PEG. There are plenty of exchanges like Vitex and Vinax and IDEX, and uh, I think it just got recently added PUSD to Uniswap. 
So on both Ethereum and, and non-Ethereum protocols, uh, where you can sell that directly in the market. So it's kind of like asking how how do you get out of Tether? Fantastic. You sell it for Bitcoin or you sell it for Ether, right? You go to an exchange and most people don't cash out Tether. It is very difficult. I don't know if you've ever tried to cash out Tether, but it's, it's a very difficult process to actually redeem cash. So 99% of people are just selling it on the market. And so what you're really asking is how does the value get balanced between the prices in the network and the prices on the external exchange. And that's the other half of the actors in the network. There's the miners we talked about that are securing the prices, and then there's the arbitragers. Yeah. So the arbitragers get also 5,000 peg per block to do the arbitrage function, which is mostly buying when somebody dumps a cheap P asset off the exchange, converting it in their wallet, and then selling it for something else. So if somebody's willing to sell PUSD for 95 cents as an arbitrager, I'll happily buy that off the market. The, the network itself will give me full value. And let's say I look today and PBTC is above reference price or PFCT is above reference price. I'll convert it in my wallet to that other asset and go sell it on the market. And I've made the difference and gotten that benefit. And what I've proposed, there's a pegnet improvement proposal process, similar to if you're familiar with how Bitcoin or Ethereum handle uh, pips or EIPs. Yeah. And the latest one is basically making a staking reward where the person that is holding P assets is getting some of that 5,000 peg per block. So 5,000 for the miners and 5,000 for the arbitragers. That's the 10,000 peg per block that flow into the system. And effectively, because there was no ICO and there was no pre-mine, the only tokens that exist in PegNet are one that were mined or rewarded arbitragers or people that converted value in. That's it. Yeah. I know a lot of these other systems have suffered from the drawdowns in whatever collateral that's backing them, and particularly ETH, and ETH's gone through a couple of sort of 80 or 90% drawdowns at the yeah. moment, and these the other systems have been strained, as we've spoken about on the channel. So I guess I'm, I'm still sort of wondering if, if there was a big run-up in price, and is there any balancing mechanisms between the 42 assets? Or in theory, could everyone be, say, everyone's buying pegged ETH, and then ETH was to go from you know $100 to $1,000. If everyone wants to sell, where is that value coming from? Is there a peg between uh, pegged, pegged Ethereum and real Ethereum as well? Or like, where does all that arbitrage, where does that value come from if a lot of people are in profit? Or is the system kind of always relying on there to be roughly an equal amount of winners and losers over time? It's not really relying on um, there sort of being netting out because the market's going to have periods of appreciation and periods of decline. Um, you can go on to pegnetmarketcap.com and sort of see a lot of the assets uh, that are in the network and you can track sort of the total value of assets in the system. And when you see a bull run, you know, the market cap goes up and when you have a bear move, the market cap goes down. I think it's really effectively what's happening is people that are putting a peg into the system is thinking of it as adding their liquidity to the system, right? And they're effectively the people that are backing, if you will, um, the value that's in there. Right, so when I take ten thousand dollars and I burn peg, I'm adding that much liquidity to the network, and I'm increasing because of the demand I've created for that peg by removing it from the system. I've rewarded the arbitragers and I've rewarded the miners. Right, I increased the scarcity of peg. So we've seen this last few months. There have been more than three hundred million peg burned in the system, which is more than fifteen percent of the total supply. So. People that wanted P assets had to buy PEG, they burned it, and that increases the scarcity of the PEG token, which is going to those miners and arbitragers. So that's sort of how I think about it in the balance of the system. Definitely increasing the liquidity is the next big step. So PEGnet launched mining last August, and the mining has taken off. The hash power is 200x increased since the launch. So there's two. Uh, giga hash of power every second going after that. And given it's a CPU algorithm, that's say 100, 200,000 machines now securing the network. So I feel very good about the security of the oracles. Like decentralized oracles are here. That's wonderful. And next thing was in October of last year, the conversion started. So I could convert between the different assets. This was a bootstrapping process too. And I think today the network crossed 
$79 million today converted between different P assets because fees on the network are a tenth of a penny, not a tenth of a percent, a tenth of a penny to convert as much value as you want. Traders are basically free to execute whatever strategy they want without having to worry about paying a quarter percent every time they do a trade. You see these, these huge volumes, even though there's only four or five million dollars in the system, people are trading often enough that 79 million dollars a day is getting converted. So mining, conversions, the next big step is really the arbitrage and the liquidity. It's still listed on relatively small exchanges, DEXs, community type uh, projects. And so it needs to break into bigger exchanges and get more liquidity. That's the challenge it, it has ahead of it. And there's a bunch of proposals in the community about how to increase that liquidity over time. Yeah, I was going to say, without an ICO and treasury and whatnot, you, I guess you don't have you know exchange listing fees to pay and things like that as well. Um, yeah. That's really interesting about the mining. Do you know if anyone would be attempting to make like an ASIC or if this is sort of CPU mineable and you've seen this huge growth, you sort of think, geez, I wonder if anyone's you know come up with something that's a bit better that we don't know about or how is all that sort of being thought about? So payment is interesting in that uh, it used the algorithm called LXR hash. And LXR hash is memory bound. Okay. So you have to have at least two gigabytes of memory in order to run the algo. And you're not using your CPU too much. Maybe on your laptop, 10% of your CPU is consumed, but mostly it's waiting on DRAM mm -hmm. to uh, pull basically numbers out of a one gigabyte uh, byte map, right? So it's, it's building the hash, but it's mostly just sitting there on memory. Uh, what's unique about this is if somebody did figure out a way to better uh, parallelize um, computation and RAM, that would be a significant computational computer science improvement for everybody. Okay. Because that's sort of been one of these big consistent problems in computer science is how to best optimize you know, uh, threads of computation and, and memory. And so that would be a really useful ASIC in the sense that it would, it would com improve computers everywhere. Um, we haven't seen one yet, despite the growth of the network, and there's probably three or four million dollars now spent every year on the computation that is currently cons uh, securing the pegnet, that, you know, I, I think someone will figure out an optimization. There are a lot of smart people out there. But in the meantime, it's created a very organic community. Yeah. Anybody with a laptop, anybody with a computer could sign up to a mining pool. Uh, so for instance, I, I funded one of the first open source pools called prosperpool.io. And people don't need any special equipment. They can just hook it up. They get their first wallet. They get a few tokens, they get into the system, they understand how it works. And that was the magic of Bitcoin back in 2010. Yeah. Well, you didn't need a special piece of equipment. You could just download the software and give it a try. And that organic community has been so sticky. Even here 10 years later, it's those million or 2 million people who got their first exposure to crypto thanks to just downloading Bitcoin QT. So it kind of feels a lot like those early days. I remember downloading Bitcoin QT wallet, I'll tell you. And it's also how, you know, Litecoin has a really sticky community. I think sure. Ra Ravencoin you saw do yeah. really well at a time when it wasn't so much about community. So that's really interesting. And again, that knowledge that you were talking about, that's right right at the edge of sort of my understanding of computer science that I find really interesting, but it's it's good to hear things like that. And it actually, your answer reminded me of when people talk about uh, quantum computers and you kind of say, well, if that ever happens, we might have to change some things, but there's a lot, a lot else to sort of worry about and there's a lot else that changes if that ever happens so sure. yeah uh, well, so what's the relationship um to this network and the protocol to sort of factum you've spoken about a lot uh, and ethereum and uh state channels and second layers i know a lot of people are experimenting down that path because we we need that sort of throughput if we're going to be doing more transactions so how does all that side of the system work well, I really believe that you should use uh, protocols for what they're best specialized for. Um, you know, a lot of people start, I think, get stuck in this mentality that there's going to be one protocol that serves all use cases. I really just don't believe in that. I don't see that anywhere else in computer science or in technology. Databases specialize, computer languages specialize, you know, services specialize, and they build network effects. So Ethereum is, is dominant when it comes to DeFi, smart contracts, exchanges, uh, token infrastructure. 
Um, but you wouldn't want to publish a huge amount of data directly on the Ethereum network. That would be very expensive. So Factum is a second layer that operates on top of Ethereum. It has a Merkle tree structure where you can publish the data and it gets anchored into the Ethereum blockchain every 10 minutes, also the Bitcoin blockchain. So you have a lot of redundancy on the security of the data itself. So that's where the miners are publishing data into Factum and the program is reading that off of the chain and it has all the security of Bitcoin and Ethereum in the back end. But if you want to use Uniswap, go buy PUSD off of Uniswap. You can put it into any Ethereum wallet, any Ethereum infrastructure, right? And so you can effectively add protocols that have different specialties to really strengthen uh, the protocol as a whole. And so it's been cool to see that. I expect more protocols will add different aspects, but those are the core things you needed to launch the system were tokenization, uh, how to run with all the infrastructure, and then of course, uh, securing the data and being able to publish that in a really cheap way. That's why it's a 10th of a penny is because Merkle trees are really efficient and publishing a little bit of hashes here and there is, is pretty cheap to do. Oh, Alex, I think you uh, might be muted. Oh, sorry, I am muted. I had a crying baby in the background, my bad. Um, More yeah, last time I did my deep dive on Factum, I'm not sure if they were writing to Ethereum yet. So when did that? Um, when did they add Ethereum as well as writing to the Bitcoin chain, roughly? Uh, they started with the Bitcoin chain in September of 2015. Okay. And then the network became uh, a feder set of federated servers. They got fully decentralized in early 18. I believe it was May of 18 with the election of all the federated servers. And I think they added Ethereum either before that in late 17 or early 18. So it's been a couple of years they've been putting uh, the anchors in there. Uh, if you go to the uh, Factum Explorer, you can see the link to the anchors in Bitcoin and Ethereum. Uh, I don't know if it's worth scrolling back two years <laughs> to find exactly what block, but it's been a long time. Um, you know, a lot of the early uh, Factum folks were involved with Ethereum, you know, uh, Paul uh, talked a bit with uh, Vitalik about the compilers, and Brian audited the script for the Genesis block uh, distributions and actually found a bug that ended up saving a bunch of ETH in the, the Genesis block, which was great. Um, so, you know, we've known that whole community. I, I wrote my information report about Ethereum during the sale and had been talking with Vitalik and Charles and all those guys before that about how to structure it because I was coming from uh, Bitcoin and then MasterCoin. Mm. So I helped the Mastcoin Foundation, which eventually Tether ended up getting built on um, before it added Ethereum more recently. And the uh, volumes just really took off in the last year. Um, so, you know, they had seen the to first token sale August of 13 with Mastercoin. And then you had Ethereum and others follow that sort of model. Um, and I talked to Vitalik a lot early on about those sort of theoretic theoretical models because I, I believe that you needed both a way for people um, to add capital for miners to be rewarded, but also for developers mm -hmm. to be rewarded. I think that's one of the things Ethereum did best was they did all three. Yes, mining was the backbone. You know, they wanted proof of stake, but it just wasn't ready. Mm -hmm. So they started with proof of work, but they allowed people to add capital by donating to the foundation. But they also reserved part of the uh, Genesis block for all the developers that built on it. You want to know why Ethereum has the largest development community in the world? Because they gave the largest reward to the largest set of developers so early on that added the real value to the system. And then those people were incentivized to keep uh, building on the network. So it's sort of been interesting to see all that evolution from those early days to where we are now. Yeah, and it really changed. In Well, there was criticism that they're not funding enough of the developers now. And particularly when ETH gets down to $80 and they're looking at their reserves and sort of saying, well, who do we fund? And I think, you know, consensus cut back their staff uh, and yeah. whatnot. So uh, I agree. That's been really interesting. It was funny enough last night, Vitalik tweeted something about marketing. And uh, I said, uh, it's probably one of the things that I think Ethereum hasn't necessarily done that well. And he actually replied, which is always cool. And he sort of agreed that, yeah, that's probably the next phase. And you hear mixed reports. Well, it's just it's frustrating when you see someone like Tron that's out there just all marketing, and then you see Ethereum that is sort of saying, "Well, you know, let's just wait until we've got probably proof of stake and we've got a really polished product, and then we'll get ourselves out there." Uh, and yeah, the different approaches that uh, everyone takes in the crypto space for marketing, I definitely think that organic is the the best approach. Yeah. Yeah. In um, case of 
In the case of Pegnet, you know, the way that they've approached it is just let the community decide. Every month, what does the community want to see? Who's actually willing to pledge towards those features and who's willing to build them? And I like that they've removed a lot of the bureaucracy because there's no Pegnet Foundation. There's nobody to apply for a grant to. Mm. Um, but by having it user and pledge driven, uh, the community has donated 23 million pegs. So more than 1% already of all the peg has been de- uh, donated to developers. And it's like two or three million more every month based on the features that people want. And developers get the reward when they deliver the code. Mm. Not when they make a proposal, not when they have an idea. Because a lot of people have an idea. I think reward systems are actually much more compelling. If you look at the uh, economics of something like the X Prize, right? A lot of people spent a lot of money trying to win that prize. Yeah. You know, one particular team was was uh, competent enough to to win it. So I think that's sort of the the direction that they're experimenting, especially since the community is is so open source. Yeah, the, I think the ICO bubble would look a lot differently if people got paid when they met their goals. Uh, <laughs> I agree. Just quickly. Again, computer science, um, you mentioned that uh, the Merkle trees are very efficient. That's the sort of stuff that Bitcoin is also you know, researching. Um, do you want to maybe just touch on that quickly for people at home and myself? Because I just, again, I find this stuff really interesting that that's where the cutting edge of technology is that we're trying to get more information into that one megabyte block at the moment and we can do it through things like that. Sure. Um, you know, effectively through Factum, billions of records have been secured. Uh, you know, it was pretty amazing in 2018. Um, one of the early adopters of Factum was a Chinese notary company in Hangzhou. And they published something like 100 million contracts and different records into the Factum blockchain. Uh, you know, basically just taking hashes of all the files and submitting them and probably only spent a few hundred dollars publishing <laughs> all this data in the blockchain. But one of the fun things that came out of that is a few years later, there was a trademark dispute or a copyright uh, dispute between Baidu and um, and uh, TikTok. So TikTok has their famous short videos, and you know Baidu apparently had sort of uh, ripped off a uh, part of the idea. But they went to court, and TikTok had used that notary service in Hangzhou and had records on the blockchain proving that their copyright was before the use by Baidu. And it went all the way to the Chinese Supreme Court. And the Chinese Supreme Court confirmed that, yes, blockchain is an immutable proof Mm. and valid in court, which as far as I'm aware, was the first time ever that it had gone to a Supreme Court. In the US and Europe, we already had digital signature laws that sort of, you know, uh, made all of that very clear, but it could have gone either way uh, in China. So it's, it's so cool to have sort of been over there, met with those guys early on, seen them use the protocol, and then these tech giants end up uh, mediating their dispute based on blockchain evidence. Um, So Merkle trees are are, are incredible. That's the genius of Paul Snow, the inventor of Factum. He's like, let's create a second layer. Let's just take that Merkle root, that one hash every 10 minutes, put that into Bitcoin, put that into Ethereum, and you can validate all the rest of the data just based on those 32 bytes. I mean, that's how amazingly efficient it is. Uh, If you look at the op return um, field in Bitcoin, for example, uh, I think it used to be 80 bytes. They they shrunk it to 40 bytes for efficiency purposes, but a hash still fits in that 32 uh, out of the 40 bytes. So you can effectively secure all this larger sets of data with just a little memo field entry mm-hmm. into Bitcoin and Ethereum. And it's like writing it in the New York Times, right? It gets distributed all over the place. You can go and see a copy and check the na- the note and that's actually sort of the how they used to do it pre pre blockchain right if something official happened you published it in the newspaper the local newspaper right you know a record of ownership or something like that so you know there's nothing new under the sun but this is a pretty cool way of, of building that i i actually took my my first daughter's birth certificate and she was one of the first uh records factomized so uh she may be one of the first provable humans to exist and uh, that's interesting <laughs> that's I, I, li- I like the newspaper story more i've never thought about that as a way to distribute the system and prove things um yeah, that, yeah. That, that's really cool as well um the next question i had was just about the arbitrages 
the 10 minute block time, uh, you know, that, that's an issue for a number of reasons which people talk mm. about. But if we were to have the other day, um, I think it's been called Black Thursday now or Black Friday, depending on where you are around the globe when Bitcoin and everything tanked last week. Um, right. What would happen there if there's a big difference from one, you know, 10 minute to another? How does that affect the mm. system and the arbitrages and whatnot? That's a great question. Um, effectively, because you're getting the medium uh, price, the, the algorithm is actually taking the 50 top miners first by hash power and then rewarding the top 25 by who's closest to the median price and actually takes the, the, the record closest to the median prices and uses that for the next block. So it smooths it out a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're looking for high frequency trading, Pignat, Pignat's not really built for that. In yeah. fact, folks that have tried to do that, like let's take Synthetics for example, mm -hmm. uh, a good project, but they've, they've, they've faced a lot of challenges with front running. Yeah. Because somebody will try to make a move on the market, which references the price, and then they're trying to do some synthetic thing at the same time. Um, and so they've had to introduce fees of a third of percent. They've had to delist a lot of things that were too small and people were trying to do that front running. They've had to have staking and slashing and trying to figure out who the bad actors are. And so instead of doing all of that, Pegnet just made the design choice that, okay, we're going to have 10 minutes. That's that's short enough, right, for most traders. And you're going to get the conversion of the next block. So you don't know exactly what the price is, but you, you've got a pretty good estimate of what the price is. Um, but you're going to get the conversion in the next block. So you can't do any front running. And so effectively, Pegnat has avoided all of those issues and not had to implement all that complexity to try to solve those issues by making it slightly slower. Because I don't think it's really competing or ever going to compete with high frequency trading. Even if it was on Hedera tomorrow and had two second resolution, yeah. you're never going to compete with the guy that has one millionth of a second <laughs> resolution on a centralized exchange, right? For sure. um, and so I think the, the selling points are different. The selling point is I'm in my own Pegnet wallet and I want to convert that value. I don't know if this has occurred to you yet, but there's no slippage. I'm referencing a price. I'm not pushing an order book. Mm. So if I want to move a million dollars, I'm not going to push the market up or down a few percent. I get whatever the price is because I'm referencing. I'm not trading with somebody else. I don't have a, a counterparty. So I don't have any slippage, which is really novel. I'm not aware of a lot of markets that have that feature, certainly none in crypto. Um, my tenth of a penny is such a low fee, it changes my whole trading strategy, right? Because if you run the numbers, if you're trading with $100,000 and you do one trade a day and you pay it a quarter percent every day, you'd rack up $90,000 in fees that year, right? Instead, what we see is a lot more trading on Pegnet. It's a tenth of a penny. If I did the same number of trades in a year, I have 36 cents hmm. of fees. You know, that's pretty attractive. And then the last thing is it solves liquidity. So if you look at a lot of the DEXs, the big challenge we still have with most of the DEXs is they're very illiquid. Yeah. Right. But here in Pegnet, you have as much liquidity as you put into the network because you don't have to find a counterparty. You could move a million dollars. No problem. Million dollars into PETH into a million dollars of PBTC. Protocol doesn't care how much you're moving. It burns one and mints the other. Are, are, you still real are you still relying on the arbitrages to a certain extent, though? Like you were saying before, um, if if the PUSD was ninety five cents, someone would say, "Oh, you know, I'm going to come in and arbitrage that." So, you know, you can say that when you enter a million dollars, there's no slippage. But if you wanted to sell that again, mm -hmm. are you relying on an arbitrager to pick up that price, or, or is that different? Sorry, if I'm confusing or I didn't understand this the first time. Can you sell it back to the system, or that's what we that's not what we were talking about before, is it? No, you 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 got it. I mean, that's the the challenge is building up the liquidity between the pegnet and the external exchanges. Okay. Right? And I think that comes with users and it comes with demand. So you're going to only be able to use Pegnet as much as there's demand for stable coins. And this is one of the really interesting thing and, and sort of leads into, you know, I think what we were talking about earlier is there's a real problem with the centralized stable coins. And people are going to realize sooner than later that they're going to need an alternative, one that doesn't have a custodian for all these legal and regulatory 
uh, reasons. And so Pegnet is effectively set up to be that alternative. It's got a completely clean slate. It doesn't have any overhead from 2017. It doesn't have any of the ICO or uh, the rest of sort of uh, baggage to come along with it. Um, it's a mining protocol and it's open source and users add value themselves directly. Yeah, that's definitely the final thing I, I guess I want to talk about. So for those people that have only sort of seen the headlines about the Financial Stability Board recommending to you know ban stable coins, what did you make of all that? I've, I've really heard some mixed reports that that headline was a bit misleading and that's not really what they said. Sure. You know, this could be months away and could go through courts. So what do you, what do you make of it all? So yes, I read the source material, which which is all, always the key. The, the headline was misleading, yes and no. It was misleading in the sense that the word ban never appears in the report. Yeah. So there's no recommendation to ban, but the effect of all of the things that they recommend is going to make it extremely difficult for, let's say, Tether to operate. You know, they want to know who the validators are. They want to know who the operator is. They want complete transparency into the reserves. Mm -hmm. They want it regulated in every country that it op all the things that Tether's not going to be able to do. And so my view is effectively it's going to bifurcate the whole stablecoin network. Either you're going to take the Libra, USDC, you're a licensed bank, literally in a relationship with the central bank, mm. and you're doing KYC and AML and the whole deal, and you're an extension of the central bank, or you're fully decentralized. And you're mining, and it's non-custodial. The only um, space that is left in the report is for uh, non-hosted wallets. So literally not even non-custodial, like if the user is doing everything themselves, which isn't the case for most uh, stablecoin networks. So we're going to need more work on fully decentralized stablecoins that don't have reserves of collateral and don't have all these intermediaries and counterparties. Um, and so that's going to be the interesting bifurcation. This has been a, a hell of a week for stablecoins. Not only did you have the Financial Stability Board, which let's remind people, that's the G20 working group mm. that came out of after the financial crisis. It's based in Basel, Switzerland, and it's run by the central banks of 24 of the top countries. US, China, Europe, Switzerland, they're all members, right? India, the whole deal, right? And this is, a not, like you said, it's non-binding, but it's the research group of the central banks making recommendations to the central banks who are their members who asked them to make these recommendations last year in 2019. So the likelihood is most of those recommendations are going to be adopted. So what does that mean? It means in about six to 12 months, people that are in that gray area between the regulated and the fully decentralized are going to start to get squeezed, right? We saw this with ICOs. Yeah. I mean, it's been so interesting for me watching Tether very early on. And every year there was these rumors that Tether wasn't solvent. And I've actually never believed those. I've always believed that they had issues with the, the banks and that's what caused the friction and whatnot. And and then I sort of thought, you know, Tether have been no good to the, the way they've treated the community and transparency. It's going to be competition and market share. And that sort of played out. Then we saw decentralized stable coins start to pop up with, with DAI and synthetics and, and pegnets and, and whatnot. But recently, I think the whole conversation has changed around mm -hmm. the global demand for US dollars. And I'm not sure how much you've read about you know, the, the milkshake theory and this global dollar shortage, euro dollar situation. I think that's really changed the demand that we're going to see for stable coins going forward. And also last month, uh, Maker integrated USDC as one of their reserves, which is almost integrating a centralized asset into a decentralized system. And they said, oh, it might be temporary or whatnot, but I thought that was a pretty game-changing move for a project that was trying to be fully decentralized on that scale to go down that path. So, I mean... Stable coins, when you talk about them to someone and, you know, a dollar's worth a dollar, that's so boring. But I think it's one of the most interesting things to talk about at the moment. Well, I mean, it's the representation of the world's real world assets coming onto the blockchain, right? And that's what we saw at the end of last year when Tether volumes passed Bitcoin. For the first time, you had real world assets exceeding native crypto assets. And I think that was inevitable. If you look at the internet, in the early days, it was very incestuous. Like they're all buying ads from each other and they had these 
inflated uh, valuations. But at the end of the day, it was when mainstream showed up and all the companies got websites and, you know, they were doing boring things like selling stuff online. Like Amazon used to get a lot of flack for not being an internet native company. They're like, we don't care. This is a valuable service. People want to buy all sorts of things. We'll do that using the internet. Mm. We don't need to, you know, be Google to be valuable. Yeah. Right. And now you see the internet companies are extremely valuable, but they're a subset of the general economy. Okay, if all of the world's financial instruments are going to move on to the blockchain in the next five, 10 years, then yes, blockchain protocols are going to be a subset of that general economy value. So we've just finally tipped over that point at which there's more value transferring via these old world assets, or legacy assets, uh, than the native blockchain ones. I think that's uh, a trend that's likely to accelerate. And I don't know what the final equilibrium is, but it might be... 10 times as many real world assets as native tokens that you need to operate the infrastructure itself. Yeah, and I think even today, Ethereum passed Bitcoin in terms of its value transfer, and a lot of that is coming from all the different stable coins as well. Yeah. Um, final thing I just want to mention, um, the Financial Art Action Task Force, they also put out their recommendations last year about each transfer from one party to another should have the IDs attached and, and whatnot. So who's involved in that just for people at home and, and myself compared to the um, Financial Stability Board that, that have put out these recommendations? They're different camps, uh, isn't it? So the, Well, it's it's pretty close related in that that came out of the G7. Ah, yes. Uh, so that's yeah, the yeah. G7 working group was, was sort of the, the after Russia was... Uh, gracefully escorted out the door. It went from the G8 to the G7. So it's a smaller uh, group, mostly of, of European, yes. Japanese, and American uh, entities. And that's that's the so-called travel rule. Mm. And it's largely being implemented by exchanges that are trying to figure out how to work with each other. Uh, shout out to the, our friends at uh, NetKey. They have one of the few identity solutions that I know is being implemented to basically solve the travel rule for all these exchanges. So there's a lot of KYC and good blockchain companies that are helping exchanges solve that problem. But again, this is why we should pick decentralized solutions, right? If you don't have a consortium, if you don't have a reserve, you don't have all the regulatory overhead of proving you're a good custodian or proving that you have honest reserves. By putting the user fully in control, I think we solve all this problem. So, I'll be very curious. The question we all, the only question we have left is how much market share will go to each side? Yeah. Do will you, it be 80% central banks and 20% decentralization or will it be the opposite? I don't know. That's the question. I mean, ideally I'd love to see, and I always did think that the decentralized projects and just business models that needed to be decentralized were always going to do the best. And that's why DeFi has taken off and all of these other projects have fallen by the wayside. But do you think it's still possible? And this would also apply for Bitcoin. If those G20 countries were to really come together and say, yeah, we're going to make Bitcoin, let's just say worst case scenario, illegal, as long as you can you know, still get fiat money into the crypto realm in some countries, whether it's you know the Cayman Islands and, and those types, and if anyone can download that open source software, Bitcoin wallet, decentralized exchanges are going to spring up and whatnot. Do you think it just it only sort of delays the inevitable? We're heading to a world no matter what where crypto is just better money? But it's better money. There's no way to stop it. Short of regulating every line of code written by a developer anywhere in the world um, or regulating the download of any program run by any computer in the world, which I think is completely impractical, and uh, hasn't happened a case of file sharing or anything else that the state has tried to shut down. Um, I think that boat has already sailed. Mm. You know, even in 2013, in March of 13, when uh, FinCEN came out with their guidance on virtual currencies, that was the first signal. And that's when Bitcoin went from $10 to $100 to $1,000 is it's not going to get banned. There are too many people at this point yeah. <laughs> that own Bitcoin. I think uh, Coinbase has passed Charles Schwab in number of, of users. Like you would upset, you know, 14 to 20 million well-heeled Americans. And now it's in pension funds. And now it's, you know, what what's much more likely is they've essentially said, okay, we're going to regulate the on-ramps and the off-ramps. And Coinbase, you have to do KYC. 
and you have to do all the right reporting. And Coinbase says, no problem. We'll, we'll certainly do that, right? And there are effectively no exchanges left that don't do KYC. I think the last one that held out the longest was, we remember BTCE? Yeah. Um, those guys were finally rested in, in Greece or whatever. <laughs> and so the question is, for these centralized stable coins, will they get the exchange treatment? And if they don't comply, they're going to end up on that arrest list? Or will they get grandfathered in and say, well, you know, transition to this system or that system? I don't know. But it's going to be interesting to see. People are going to have to choose a side. They're going to have to choose a regulated direction or a fully user-controlled direction. And I don't think there's going to be much middle ground between them. No, I mean, it's so hard to predict in the future, but it definitely... Oh, that might be the postman there, mate. Um, uh, I definitely see the future where the, we've got this next big cycle where Bitcoin goes through a tremendous run in all crypto assets. And if it gets to that trillion dollar market cap, that's when regulators start to say, wow, we need to clamp down on all these stable coins. Sure. Well, I don't even think it has to get that big. If we take the ICO wave as any indication, there were about 10 billion that flowed in pre-regulation and 10 billion that flowed in uh, shortly after regulations, about 20 billion and flowed in. And stablecoins the other day hit $8 billion. And here we are this week with Libra's implementation of how they're going to comply. You have the Financial Stability Board saying, here's the global consensus on what you have to do. And here is China saying, here's how we're going to implement it on our own tech stack. We effectively had every major jurisdiction in the world in a week come out on how they're going to treat regulated stablecoins and the big companies on how they're going to implement it. It's actually, you know, kind of coincidence. You know, I, I noticed in the new Libra white paper that they do mention they had some conversations with the uh, Financial Stability Board. So shouldn't be a surprise that they came to the same conclusions about what they needed to do to the system in order to uh, make them happy. Yeah, absolutely. I wasn't surprised either where Libra backed down. I never thought they were going to get away with recreating the special drawing right or, or any of that stuff. Well, it's interesting. If you read the new white paper, they've got an interesting lever. So th they've gone halfway. They're going to use the single fiat for dollar, euro, pound, and Singaporean dollar. But if you're in a country that doesn't yet have its own single currency, Libra, don't worry. That's what the Libra basket is for. And so you, Mr. Indian user or Brazilian user, uh, get to use the SDR. And it'll be determined by some process to be determined by the IMF about what that balance in the basket is. I wouldn't be too shocked if it's it's different or not that different than the existing SDR allocations, which is still pretty dollar heavy uh, if you look at the, the... And then the question becomes, do the Chinese want to participate? Because they recently lobbied the IMF to be included as the fifth currency after the dollar, the euro, the pound, the yen, and now the yuan in SDRs. So will they go their own way with the blockchain services network and what they're doing, or will they also want to get included in the Western system? It's hard to imagine that if it goes through the IMF, they'll be excluded because they're a fairly big player these days. Uh, I, th I thought the Yuan was already in the special drawing right basket of currencies now. Is that correct? Yeah. 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 Well, got added a couple of years ago, but that was after a lot of lobbying and them effectively threatening to create an alternative to the IMF. Yeah, that's right. That's that right. Get their way, right? Um, so all these power centers are shifting, and it'll be interesting to see. But but what it tells me is, I'm actually pretty encouraged. What you've done is you've set aside most of the interesting things in the world you can do, and said Facebook you can't play, and Google you can't play, and none of you banks, none of you can play in that stuff, because come on. How are they going to serve the bank the unbanked? The reason they're unbanked is because they don't qualify for AML and KYC. You don't have a permanent address. You don't have an ID. There's a reason these people don't have banking services, financial services, not for lack of competition to provide them services, is it's the law prevents those people from being served. That's the ugly truth about why we have an unbanked in the world. And so effectively, Facebook is and Libra Association has left you know, that language of social impact, but they have no practical means of serving those people if they implement all these draconian laws that have been set up the last 20 years by the central bank. So that leaves a green field for every startup in the world that wants to do decentralized services directly to people, 
they don't have to worry about those 800 pound gorillas because they've just been told they can't play the game. Absolutely. I think that's probably a, a great place to wrap up if you've got any uh, final thoughts. But that's been such a great chat. I wasn't sure what to uh, expect. Uh, and we dived into some really timely stuff there, I think, David. So, yeah, any final messages for people at home? Uh, no, I, this has been great, Alex. I appreciate your your thoughts. It's nice to talk with somebody else who is as deep into DeFi and stable coins and all these trends that are going on. I would say if people want to check it out, I've already said pegnetmarketcap.com shows you all the assets. Ptrader.co is uh, where you can get a wallet, use the tools. I'm sure we'll put the links in the video below. Um, but yeah, no, join, join the effort. This is a participatory sport. You do not have to sit on the sidelines. You can contribute code. You can become a miner. You can trade in these systems. No permission required. So I hope people have a lot of fun with it. Fantastic. I hope everyone's enjoyed that. Sorry about Henry barking at the end there, guys. That is the world we live in at the moment with isolation, everyone at home. But uh, David, I'll get this up on all the socials and tag you guys. It's been fantastic. So thanks for joining us. Cool. Absolutely. Take care. Thanks, guys.